Well, I'll go ahead and get started. And tonight is the last night of the parent nights for this year with St. George Academy. Um, have you guys had opportunities to come to some of the others? I know I've seen you here before. Well, glad you were able to make it tonight. And this is going to be an overview of mental health. So what's great about that is we're going to cover kind of a broad topics, but then we can jump in to specifics. It's important to start out by asking a question. What do you guys think? How is the mental health state of America today? What would you say? Not so good. Not so good? Wow, I'm, I'm really surprised by that. Well, no, actually not really, you're right. There's some recent statistics came from the CDC here. We've got 44% of teens today reported that uh, they persistently felt sad or hopeless during the past year. And 80% of them never seek help. So that's actually the, the most scary statistic for me. I mean, we're, we're approaching near half of our youth and young adults are struggling with anxiety, depression, all sorts of different uh, mental health concerns, but we're still kind of pretending like it's, it's not a thing. And so, you know, I mean, it's really no secret, everybody from Harvard to, uh, you know, NPR and CBS and CNN and everybody's kind of jumping in on this. There's this cry for help. And another really interesting um, thing from that same statistic, that study that produced that 44%, is they broke it down by boys and girls. Teen girls now show that 57% of teen girls say that they're, um, their hopelessness increased dramatically from 2011 to 2021. So uh, that's uh, more than half. I mean, that's, that's really alarming for a lot of us. And so you got to ask yourself, you know, what are these contributing factors? What is going on? And as far as we've been able to see, there's a few major things. Number one, the family. The family is under attack and it's taken it hard and people are feeling the effects of um, the pressures on family. Society is largely um, volatile and difficult for teens to feel you know, connected or stable because of all the political unrest and pandemics and all kinds of stuff going on. So, and then of course there's the technology side to all of this and we'll, we can kind of get into some of those specifics, but technology is playing a huge role in the mental health crisis that we're facing. So, but the good news is, is there is hope and we absolutely know that to be true. Just to give you a little background on myself so you know where I'm coming from. I'm uh, Joe Newman and I'm the Chief Information Officer at Life Launch Centers. It's an adolescent mental health facility. So we help families overcome anxiety, depression, suicide, trauma every day in group counseling, in individual counseling. You know, we come and do these presentations because we largely see this massive problem and we're trying to increase public awareness. So how do we do that? that? That's kind of what my job is, is to get out there and make things. I make our website and training modules and online um, you know, videos. And, and then I also have the opportunity to come and do presentations like this at schools. And um, it's a great opportunity. I love getting in front of parents and really digging into how we can help this rising generation um, overcome their their struggles. So that's what I do professionally, but this one also, I felt like you guys should know a little bit about me personally. This is us. This is my family. I, we love kids. Okay. So this is an old picture. It's actually two years old. So we had seven kids at that time. We recently added to the crew. There's our latest crew member. And as you can see, we love boating. We love Lake Powell. We love doing fun things there because this is kind of a place where we get to push limits. We're building water slides off the edges of cliffs and flying around on the flyboard. And you know, my, this is my oldest son and he learned how to do a backflip on the wake board. It's called a back roll. Wait, 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 wait. So yeah, we're, we're like high energy, high adventure kind of family. But I want you to know for every one moment of these, there's about a thousand moments of these. <laughs> right? Yep. So we're not like rose color glasses looking at the world here. The, uh, there's a lot of challenge in raising kids. And if for all the good moments, there's, you know, probably 10 times as many challenging moments. So um, I get it. We, we feel it and we love kids. In fact, we're adding to our family again. Right now we've got 
our ninth child on the way. I can't believe it. Uh, it be, it, uh, the baby's due in June, so coming up quick. So that's kind of me personally. And really what we're talking about tonight is mental health. And mental health is a lot like our physical health in many ways. Okay, when I look at these two guys up here, you got this big guy and this little guy here. Um, let me ask you, do, does this little guy have all the strength and ability that this big guy does physically? No, he doesn't. Could he? No. When he's older. One day. Okay, one day. Yeah, what's required? Maybe some time. Yep. What else? Eating right, exercises. Eating right, exercises, Eat specific right. exercises. Yeah. <laughs> specific lifestyle choices that are going to help him grow physically and be strong and capable, right? Well, our mental health is very much the same way. We're not born with all the mental health and emotional resilience that we need to be fully functioning, capable adults. And it takes specific exercises and it takes some development. It's not just going to happen when they're young. There's actual brain development that's a part of that growth process that we're going to talk about. Help you understand a little bit more about what happens and how they grow their mental health. Okay, so pretty much everybody comes into this world a pretty happy little baby. There, there's this like real special infinite potential about a brand newborn. You know, and for whatever reason, somewhere along the way, some of them end up coming into the world with they have more challenges and maybe it's environmental. Maybe it's a little bit of nature. Maybe it's a combination of both but somewhere. They experience these challenges and it can develop into these mental health concerns or they they start withdrawing. They start experiencing challenges in life and ultimately can want, can end up a very anxious and di difficult um, mental health lifestyle. And so, yes, there is nature components and there is also nurture components. And understanding both will help us have the most success possible. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be unique to each person, but understanding that, that we all have the potential, this infinite potential within us is important. So now also when it comes to um, mental health care, there's a huge spectrum of services available, which most parents aren't really aware of. When a lot of parents start to recognize that their child has some mental health concerns, usually the first thing they think about is um, the lowest level of care, what we call outpatient care, where they go to the counselor for once a week for an hour. Or parents don't do anything and they just kind of wait and see and they work under that philosophy. If it's not broke, don't fix it, right? And so then they wait until they get to a point where they're suicidal. Maybe they've attempted suicide and they end up in the hospital. And then there's a whole bunch of backpedaling and trying to figure out what we can do to support this child. And so what we're hopeful to do is understand that there's a whole lot of different levels of care in between. So. Outpatient care, the lowest level of care, it's usually either exploratory or main maintenance, okay? And much like our physical health, like if you wanted to increase your strength or endurance and you wanted to do that by exercising or spending extra time in physical activity, once a week is kind of like a maintenance program. You're not going to really grow stronger or have more endurance just by you know, engaging once a week for an hour, right? So most of us go with the three times a week kind of program at a, at a gym or an exercise program or something. You've got to see like three to four times a week to see that growth and progress. So most, um, most parents, when they come to us, they want growth and progress because their kids are already at a point where anxiety, depression, or some other mental health concern has started to inhibit their life. Like they're not going to school or they don't want to interact socially or they can't hold a job or they don't, don't want to drive or date, these kind of adulting behaviors, right? So in order to see growth from that position, we have to engage more than just the one hour a week maintenance program. And that's what we call the intensive outpatient program. That's just a, like an insurance clinical designation. That means three times a week group and they have one individual group. 
Okay. Then there's also other, other um, steps like crisis response care, of course, the emergency room, like we hope, we hope we never end up here. But this is called the continuum of care because there's steps up and there's steps down. Okay, so lots of times if we end up here in the hospital with a suicide attempt, if that child is still struggling, they may need to step up into residential treatment in order to keep them safe where they can have constant supervision and safety applied. Where a lot of times parents can't provide that in home because they have jobs and they have other responsibilities, right? So there's also step-down care. So a lot of times after a suicide attempt, the hospital is equipped to help stabilize them physically, but then as soon as they're stabilized, usually after about a week, then they, re they release them and the child returns to the same environment that caused a lot of the stressors in the first place. And so we hear the hospitals say all the time how it's frustrating that that, that emergency room sometimes seems like a revolving door. And it can be you know, a month or a couple of weeks even just between visits for the same patient over and over. And that means that they, they either need to step up or step down. Because going back to the same environment isn't going to provide long-term progress. So step down into like an intensive outpatient program is very helpful that way. Um, and, and, or step up if, there's, if they're not um, willing to keep themselves safe, then they may need to. And, and we do that all the time. When we have people come in for an assessment, we'll look at, um, we'll do a full assessment for them. And very often if they have plans for suicide and they've written notes and they've got all these, these indicators that suicide could be imminent, then we refer up because that's a higher level of care than what we do, okay? So um, we also hear a lot of parents talk about how they've tried therapy, they've tried counseling and it didn't work. And usually what they're talking about is the once a week for an hour. And that's very understandable. It's kind of like if I want to get stronger, faster, or have more endurance, it's not gonna happen if I'm just, you know, physically exercising once a week. So that's the continuum of care. Recognize that there are steps up and steps down depending on where your, your loved one is at. Really what we're talking about when it comes to mental health is this, this word that's become very popular, resilience. Right, And we talk a lot about resilience. It's the ability to pick yourself up, dust yourself off and move forward. That's what we hope for our loved ones. When they experience difficult things that they can overcome them and grow and progress. And we need this in all different aspects of life. Like number one, in relationships. Think about how resilient you have to be in relationships. If you don't have resilience in relationships, you don't have relationships, right? Because relationships by nature are difficult. And so that ability to bounce back from those difficult things and grow, that's what makes it fulfilling, our relationship fulfilling. Same thing in education, helping our kids realize that they're not going to ace every test. They're not going to get every answer correct. And that's okay because there's still ability to come and work and progress. And, and actually the failure is going to teach them more than the constant success. That's a major word. And then work, we hear all the time. Kids today, they, they're having a hard time holding down jobs or keeping a job. And, and why is that? I often ask the kids, you know, um, who has a job? And they're usually, you know, working at a fast food restaurant or some kind of, you know, it, high school kid job. And ask them, you know, do you ever experience difficulties at work? You know, like maybe angry customers or difficult relationships with your, with your boss. And they're like, yeah, of course. And so why do you keep going back? If it's difficult and unpleasant, why do you keep going back? Well, it's because of the money, right? We, there's something worthwhile being there for. And that's the, that, you know, resilience is what says, even though it's difficult, I'm going to go back because I want that thing that's, that's worthwhile, right? So the same thing is true with emotional resilience. A lot of kids today are opting out of emotions. It's like too difficult to express emotion. So we're just not going to have emotion. And I mean, I've seen this personally. It's, it's kind of a cultural thing now. You know, like our, um, our kids are not immune from it either. And we have to teach these emotionally resilient principles in order for them to feel um, the value of going through those difficult emotions. So now I've got to warn you, what we're going to talk about tonight is a little bit counterculture.
Okay, what we're talking about tonight is not necessarily what the greater population is doing. I often kind of see myself as like the modern day hippie. You know, we're like counterculture in parenting and, and uh, in our philosophy somewhat. But when, you know, we talk about peace and love, it's not necessarily like how the hippies meant it. We're talking about love is sacrifice, doing the harder thing because it's right. And peace is peace of mind through choosing a wiser way. And so when I say you want, if you want different results, we've got to do things a little differently. So we're going to provide you some of these tools, some of these resources you can put into practice even tonight that are going to probably be different than what you've done in the past if you're looking for different results. Okay. So first of all, uh, almost every mental health concern out there is onset by overwhelming emotional responses, okay? Emotional regulation helps us cope in healthier ways rather than turning to the unhealthy ways like addiction and isolation and substances and destructive behavior and numbing, okay? These are the kind of things that are destructive or counterproductive, right? And what we're trying to teach is the healthy coping tools that help you process a difficult emotion and move forward. Because like I said, if it's, you know, addiction, what, whatever kind of addiction, screen addiction, uh, pornography, gambling, alcohol, drugs, whatever it is, there's an overwhelming emotional response that, that triggers them to go use. And learning how to cope with those triggers will interrupt that process and rewire the brain to a healthy behavior rather than the destructive behavior. Okay, whether it's uh, body image issues, same thing. It's a, that's all about control, right? And there's a trigger that comes along with every time that, that um, desire comes in and, and you use these healthy coping mechanisms to rewire that brain to a constructive behavior rather than the destructive behavior. So uh, it's, it's really amazing because in our clinic, we see kids with all different kinds of mental health concerns, but we're able to help guide them to healthy behavior all through this emotional regulation um, practices, okay? And it's nothing that we made up, by the way, that's all um, grounded in dialectical behavior therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, the resilience research from Brene Brown, a whole bunch of stuff from um, Christopher Germer and Marshall Linehan and all the kind of leading researchers, okay? And what we did is just took the best from all these different models and arranged it into this resilience model, okay? And we're gonna go through it kind of step by step and um, give you some resources along the way, okay? So the very first thing that we gotta understand about building resilience with our, within ourselves and, and anyone else is we've gotta have it directed from our goal or our values. It has to be values driven because if you're, um, we often want things in life, but if it's not connected to a value or a driving force, we're not going to have the um, we're not going to have the drive to achieve it. So uh, there's a and there's a lot of ways to do this. So the, the way that we do this is this QR code takes you to a, a PDF worksheet that helps identify what your values and goals are. And it's there's a whole list of like. 50 different values up there. And you can fill in your own as well. But what you do is you go through and you circle everything that is meaningful to you. So it could be like um, honesty or trustworthy or um, friendship or love or um, adventure or, and there's just all these different values, right? And you narrow it down through a process of elimination down to your top two values. And when you understand what your top two values are, then you understand what drives you in life. And now once you know what direction you're going, then you can set goals to help move you in that direction. Okay. And so um, this is a simple worksheet that we use it. And honestly, it's been super helpful for us. Like when I was struggling, understanding my teenage daughter, um, I, I did this values and goals um, exercise for myself and I brought it to her and I said, hey, you know, I was kind of looking at myself to see what motivates me in life. And I did this exercise and it came out that surprise, surprise, my top two values are adventure and friendship. You know, you could probably tell by some of those Lake Powell photos that, that yeah, that's what motivates me in life. And what do you think? Would you be interested in trying this with me? 
let's go through and identify what your top two values are. And um, it came out that hers were love and respect. And so I looked at that and I thought, okay, as long as I'm doing things in life to help her feel loved and respected, then we're going to have a more positive relationship. She's going to be moving towards her values, right? We even did this together where she and I sat together and said, okay, what do we value in our relationship? You know, and this is a, a, a you know, co-decision here where um, if it's valuable to you and it's valuable to me, we'll both circle it. If it's not valuable to one of us, that's okay. We don't need to circle it. We narrowed it down and now we understood that these two things are what is going to help our relationship grow. So this values exercise is tremendous in helping connect people and understand what motivates and drives them in life. Um, the next thing we do is we talk about some brain development. Okay, remember how we talked about how the kid could have the physical strength and ability that the older person could with some development, right? Well, here's the neurological development that happens um, to help explain what's going on inside our child's mental health development, okay? And it has to do with three parts of the brain. There's the hind brain, the mid brain, and the fore brain, okay? There's, each of these sections kind of has its own unique function. The hind brain is the very first part of the brain to develop, and it happens in embryonic development. It's the thing that turns on our automatic life support functions, like our heartbeat, our breathing, digestion, all of those things that we don't even have to think about, but are crucial to our survival. And because it's the very first thing that was developed, it takes priority over anything. If our basic life functions are not being supported, all of the other worries in life go away and it focuses on what you need to survive, right? Um, try holding your breath for about 30 seconds and you'll see that it doesn't matter how much anxiety or what homework or what job or what relationship is frustrating you, you're not thinking about that all your body can think about is how do I get my next breath, right? And so that's a really important role that we know that the hind brain controls those automatic life support functions. The mid brain, that's a second part of our brain to develop. And you see this, you get to see this pretty evident with newborns. You guys ever been around newborns lately? What do newborns do? Cry. Cry. Coo. Coo. Eat, sleep, and poop. That's about it. They don't really do a whole lot, right? They just, they're just kind of there. But then sometime you see right around four months old, that midbrain starts to turn on and develop. And all of a sudden they get facial recognition and social smiles. And you're looking down on this thing and you're like, oh man, I've been changing your diapers for four months. And now finally he smiles at me and it's all worth it, <laughs> right? Because we're emotionally connecting now because they have that emotional development starting happening right then. So, and then of course, it's this lifelong journey of trying to understand all of the emotions that come from our emotional midbrain. And so um, we'll come back to the midbrain in a minute, but that's where all of our emotions originate. Then you got the forebrain, right? Um, this is the section of the brain that it's there. You're born with something like 10 billion neurons. And this is the logic center. This is where uh, behavior equals response, right? And as a child, you learn all of these different um, behaviors and responses and these neurological pathways are formed. But really at about the age 11 is where your body goes through this process called pruning. And it starts to trim away all the unused and unnecessary um, neurons. But that process takes some time. It actually doesn't finish until you're about 25 years old. So the things that are introduced into a child's life, particularly between those ages of 11 to 25, are really critical in how they affect the rest of their lives. And so that's why um, we try to introduce a lot of productive things into their life at that time, learning music, learning languages, learning school and, you know, reading and all of these logical thought processes, right? That's where a lot of that, that's why that schooling process happens during that time. So that's our logical forebrain. Okay. Now there's this tiny little section of the midbrain right here, this little bean shaped guy. It's called the amygdala and it has one function. You, you guys know what it does? It initiates a certain alarm. What's the, what's the name of the alarm? Do you remember? Butterfly. 
Fight, flight, or freeze. That's right. Fight, flight, or freeze. And um, yeah, and the amazing thing is that we're not just like making this stuff up. You can actually see it with current brain scan technology. When the amygdala senses a threat, um, we can see that the electrical synapse in that forebrain will literally go dark. And all of the electrical synapse will, have, will focus around the emotional section of the brain, the midbrain. And so we start to make emotional decisions um, instead of logical decisions, because that logic is just shut off, right? You see a bear on a hiking path, you're not, you're, you're not running away from the bear going, hey, I wonder if that, soft, if that fur is really soft, or is that a Kodiak or a grizzly bear? I can't tell, right? You're not thinking that. You're just like, get me out of here, right? That's the fight, fight, or freeze. And um, when we experience a triggering event or something that is a threat or a perceived threat, then that is what shuts off that midbrain. And we become what's called emotionally hijacked. Okay? So exploring what our triggers are um, is a really crucial key of mental health. So, because today we don't often experience bears on the hiking path especially maybe in St. George, Utah. Maybe there's other areas there too. But we don't have a whole lot of um, physical threat to our lives today, much like our ancestors of the past did. We have other kind of threat, more like perceived or social threat. That's why when a, a child posts a, you know, something on Instagram and they don't get enough likes or hearts or comments, they can often experience a triggering event and become emotionally hijacked to the point where they throw the phone across the room and it explodes on the wall, right? That may be fighting, right? Uh, or they may just like put it away and say, I don't ever want to go out again. You know, I, I hate my friends and the world sucks, right? That's maybe freezing um, or yeah, flighting, they can do the same thing where they run away, don't want to be with their friends. And why would that be the case? When you think about from a per primitive perspective, if you weren't socially accepted by your tribe, what did that say about your survivability? Down. Down, right? And that's the thing about our amygdala. It's a very primitive part of our brain that works very same way it did when it was you know, thousands of years ago and when we lived in tribes. And so when you consider um, these kind of behaviors, particularly as we see manifest in ourselves and in our children, it can help us understand a little bit more and um, uh, maybe empathize a little bit more with them. So, um, and so emotional hijacking, that's an important thing to understand too. Like what, what do you look like when you're emotionally hijacked? Are you a fighter? Are you a flighter? Or are you a freezer? And I'll often ask students to participate in a demonstration where I'll produce a scenario where like you come home late for curfew, right? And your dad's there and he is upset and he's like, I can't believe you're late. I let you stay out and you didn't show me any respect and you came home all late. What do you do? Do you tend to justify the reasons why you're late? You might be a fighter. Do you run away from the situation and go slam the door and just cuddle up in your room and avoid it? That could be a flighter, right? Or do you just stand there and stonewall and pretend like he's not even talking to you and you could be a freezer? So understanding what we look like when we're emotionally hijacked is really crucial. This was helpful for my wife and I. I was a wrestler in high school. I love... Um, like combat, I'm, I feel like I'm at my best, I'm fast, I'm, I'm, I can think quickly. Um, so I have realized that I'm a fighter, right? My wife, on the other hand, she does not like conflict. And when there's conflict, she just kind of stonewalls, right? And so if I'm hijacked, emotionally hijacked, and she's emotionally hijacked, which happens really quickly when you know one person starts reacting emotionally and voices get raised or anything like that, that everybody gets hijacked, then we're not gonna make any progress because we're gonna have just emotional hijacking versus emotional hijacking. It looks like me trying to you know, fight my way through the Great Wall of China. Like, we're not getting anywhere. So we learn to disengage, right? Recognize when we're hijacked, be able to step back and say, now we need to do some growth, some, some coping mechanisms, some coping skills in order to 
progress, okay? When we make decisions out of emotion, there's usually a lot of cleanup work in the form of apologies or picking up the broken phone off the side of the wall or, you know, um, we do things that we often have to apologize for later. When we react out of logic, then we often are able to solve a problem and move forward and pro with progression. Right, and that's what we're trying to do is when, it's not that we're trying to avoid emotional hijacking, that's gonna happen regardless. That's what we're designed to do, is designed to recognize threat. But how do we work through it in a productive way? So the first thing is these distress tolerance tools, okay? There's a whole bunch of them. In fact, I'm going to put another QR code up here. I think it's on the next slide that takes you to the Life Launch Center's Emotional Resilience app. And there's like 40 of these distress tolerance tools on there. And you can practice them and see which ones work best for you. These are the same ones that we teach in clinic to the youth, to the parents, so that we learn these healthy coping skills. I'll teach you two right now. Um, one of my favorites is paced breathing. Okay, you've heard a lot of like popular TV shows and films talking about um, just breathe, just breathe. Well, there's more to it than just breathing, um, particularly when you involve counting. And um, it's a form of mindfulness where you turn your attention inward. Then that really tends to quieten the amygdala and rec help your amygdala recognize you're not dying. You still have breath. Okay, so again, it goes back to the automatic life support functions. You're reassuring your amygdala that your automatic life support functions are still working. So paced breathing works like this. When you breathe in, your heart rate naturally goes up. When you breathe out, your heart rate naturally goes down. If your overall output is greater than your input, then your heart rate will stabilize and your blood pressure and lots of other very mood stabilizing physical things in your body. So um, I use this all the time. Like, for recreation as well as for um, work or whatever else. If there's something I'm stressed about, maybe a public speech, right? Maybe a performance, maybe a conversation with, a, I know a difficult conversation with a loved one. I can use paced breathing where I'll count in for the count of four and then I'll count and I'll breathe out for the count of six, right? So it's like, out. And again, six. And I'll even increase it where it's like, I'll go breathe in for five, out to 10, breathe in for six, out to 12. That's one. Um, here's another one. It's, uh, I'll give it some context too. And this has to do with file memory name recall and association. So. Uh, when my daughter was learning how to parallel park, I was, I was a, trying to be a good dad. And so we went down to Hilton Drive, right by the car dealerships, right? And this is not a very um, trafficked road. But um, at the time, for whatever reason, I decided we should try this in our Suburban. So we went and drove down there. And there was this gap between two really nice trucks that was about four car lengths. Like there's plenty of room to do this, right? And so, I know, like, I, so anyway, I'm driving and I go, and I, here's how we parallel park. We pull up next to the car, put it in reverse, turn the wheel, back in, you know. And so then I'm like, okay, now I'm gonna walk you through it next time. So she jumps in the driver's seat. I'm sitting next to her in the passenger seat. And then I'm telling her, okay, turn the wheels now. Okay, keep backing up. Okay, now turn the wheels the other direction. And success, right? And I'm like, okay, now it's the real test. I'm gonna get out of the car. I'm going to let you do it without me saying anything, right? And so <laughs> you're already like, what? Setting ourselves up, right? So anyway, she starts to back up and she starts to turn too early and she's headed towards this guy's truck. And I'm standing like on the corner of the truck. Like if she's going to hit this truck, she's going to hit me first. And so I'm like, uh, you're getting too close. You're getting too close, too close, too close, too close. Stop, 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 stop. Right? It's, you see that escalation happen really quick. Finally, I'm like, just hit the brake. And she does. She finally, even though I'm yelling at her, like to her credit, she was able to process through that and get her foot on the brake. Thankfully, not the accelerator. Anyway, she stopped about two inches away from this truck. And I'm like, 
what are you doing? Like, could you not hear? Like, we're in no rush. Like, just move slowly. Like, anyway, could you not see? Anyway, so she's hijacked. I'm, I'm like, what's the matter? And she's like, well, it's really hard when you're yelling at me. I'm like, ah, you're right. It's my, I am absolutely the one causing this. So let's just take, let's, we need to get, we're, we're both now hijacked. Right? We both need to restore power back to our forebrain before we can proceed, before we can be successful at this logic, logical activity. So just put it in park and let's do an exercise. And what we did was um, put a name to the, uh, of a city to the letter of every, of every letter of the alphabet. Right? So we're like A, <sighs> Albuquerque, B, <sighs> Boston, C, Chicago. Right? We got to about J. And then she says, okay, dad, I think I'm ready. I'm like, okay, all right, let's try this again. <laughs> Just keep your eye on that, window, on that mirror. And she did it, you know, she recognized how she had plenty of room. She didn't have to turn too early. Anyway, it was a success. And it was largely because we were able to step away from the, pro the problem, the emotional problem that was happening and um, return some power back to our forebrain to act logically. And it was beautiful because we didn't have a whole lot of cleanup work to have to uh, repair that. So there's a whole bunch of distress tolerance tools. There's mindfulness. There's all kinds of self-compassionate touch and loving kindness phrases and all the most. These aren't things we came up with, by the way. These are research-based practices that have um, data to show the efficacy of them. So feel free to explore that. I'll put that um, QR code up here in a minute. So we do some distress tolerance tools to restore power back to the forebrain, okay? The next thing we do is sensation and emotion, okay? So this um, principle is being able to recognize your sensations and emotions. It's kind of another form of mindfulness where you turn that focus inward and identify what's happening internally, okay? Again, this is, this is what helps quieten that amygdala because it's saying, you know, we're in danger, we're in danger, but you say, no, it's insistent. What sensation am I feeling right now? Oh, my, my fists are clenched and my teeth are tight and I just, I'm all tensed up. Okay, now what emotion, what name might be associated with those sensations? Anger? Yeah, yeah, I'm angry. And amazingly, research will tell us that when you just put a name, we also recommend to put a number to it. So you, you say, I'm angry, you know, and zero to 100, how angry are you? God, I'm, I'm like 80% angry, right? Like, I'm really angry. Uh, when you do that, you can, it will lower the intensity of that emotion by up to 70%. And this happens, this happens for all of the emotions, right? So if you're depressed, just by being able to say, I feel so depressed. Like, I'm depressed to like 70. Or I'm anxious, right? Oh, man, I'm stressed out for this test. I am so stressed. I'm stressed to like an 80 I did this when I was taking the real estate exam and I was overwhelmed and I was like, I can't, couldn't focus. I spoke it out loud to myself. Um, so put a name, we call it name it to tame it. Okay, name that emotion to tame that emotion. So um, the next step is stories in my head, okay? This is a really crucial step because the stories in my head is often the reason we get emotionally hijacked, okay? The story in my head is this principle that whenever you experience a triggering event or some, yeah, thing that you're worried about, our brains tend to fill in the unknowns by itself. And what kind of things does our brain fill in the gaps with? Past trauma, yeah. It's like, it's like all the doomsday worst things that we could think of, right? So uh, my kid's not home in time for curfew, right? That must mean that they're probably out there run off the road by a drunk driver in a ditch, dead now, and I'm never going to see my kid again, right? Rarely do we ever think like, oh, well, I bet they saw somebody who needed help changing their flat tire on the side of the road and they stopped to help them, right? We don't do that. Our, that story in our head always makes up this doomsday story. And that's the reason why we get hijacked. So being able to talk this story out, out loud to a person, sometimes we even write it down, that helps us process that story and start to 
separate fact from fiction. The fact is my son's not home and it's half hour past curfew. The fiction is he's dead in a ditch somewhere and I can't deal with that. I don't know if that's the case. I, I can't deal with what I can deal with is he's 30 minutes late and we'll have to address what happens when he gets home, right? So uh, you can't deal with fiction, you can deal with fact. So separate that story in your head. And again, what you'll find is that it returns power back to that forebrain. And then we can actually now at this point start to identify and solve problems. That's what we want to do as soon as we recognize a triggering event. But the problem is if we're emotionally hijacked, like I mentioned before, there's going to be a lot of cleanup work. We don't want to do, make those decisions out of emotion, but give it some time for that logical center to restore power so that you can identify productive solutions um, that don't require as much cleanup. The last two stages here are what I call the, the uh, connecting stages or the healing stages. Now this section, the go with the flow, is kind of this idea of radical acceptance. You're going to experience things in life all the time where you have no control over them. Um, we talk with kids a lot about this, particularly when parents are, their marriages are splitting up or there's circumstances in their home that are way beyond their control. And this idea of you, you're going to experience difficult emotions as part of life. You're expected to experience difficult emotions and being able to be okay with that and go with the flow of the emotion, let it come, but let it go. You know, sometimes you're going to wake up in a bad mood for like no apparent reason. And studies show that when you just accept it and say, huh, today's gonna be one of those days. And you don't have to attach to it like, well, why is it one of those days? Well, it's probably because my son didn't come home on time for curfew last night, and so now it's his fault, right? We start to attach to those emotions like we wanna hold on to them and keep them rather than letting them come and letting them go. So. Um, go with the flow of emotions. Don't attach to them. And then finally, it's kind of almost human instinct to want to um, connect with somebody over these difficult emotional experiences we have. Uh, and it should be, because this is how we actually heal. When you have somebody, like it's kind of therapeutic for parents to get together and say, is your child late for curfew? My child's late for curfew too. Wow, right? We talk about it. And by being able to share these experiences, building healthy connections with someone who can show empathy and show understanding and show um, opportunity to, to <laughs> yeah, to uh, hear you, that's going to be very, very healthy and, and helpful. And a lot of times, particularly with teens today, they don't have very many people in their life that they can do that with. And that's why a therapist is very, very helpful. A lot of this thing is getting in the way of those real deep, meaningful connections, right? So many of our kids base the level of their connection with another person based on like how long they've been texting that person or that they've been texting them all day long even though if you've read your kids' text threads, you know that they're pretty shallow conversation, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, it's tremendous, the things that they text about. Um, but what we found is that when we encourage those activities where our kids interact with other, um, other teenagers and have opportunities to have deep, meaningful conversations, they feel way more fulfilled, okay? So... Those are some of the strongest tools you can um, use to teach um, emotional resilience, uh, to practice those coping skills. This app is a web-based app. You don't have to download it. It's just a website. And uh, it's totally personal, right? This is to put the resilience model into practice. You can go in there and identify what are my triggers? What does it look like when I get hijacked? Which distress tolerance tools do I like? And you can give them a heart and kind of build your own emotional toolbox. Pass that, that uh, website on and they can sign up for a free account. It's just a totally free resource. So, and it's something that we give our clients as well as their parents so that they're learning the same principles and start to implement these healthier practices into their family system. So that's um, 
the resilience portion, I want to address specific concerns. So what do you guys think? What's your top mental health concern in your lives or maybe that you see in society, something you'd like to talk about? Could be anxiety, depression, suicide, trauma, technology. What motivated you to come out of your house tonight to hear more about mental health? Um, I think sadness, um, verge of possible depression. Um, I want to talk about parenting and enabling because this is not like an individual thing. This is a cultural thing today. Okay. And when I talk about that, um, it's wrapped up in different things like this concept of anti-fragile. Have you guys ever heard of this concept? It's kind of developed by uh, this Dr. Jonathan Haidt out in uh, New York, and he's written several books about this. Um, but it's basically that some systems that are anti-fragile, they grow rigid, weak, and inefficient when nothing challenges them or pushes them to respond vigorously. The modern obsession with protecting young people from feeling unsafe is, we believe, one of the sev several causes of the rapid rise in rates of adolescent depression, anxiety, and suicide. So the concept is like if you take a wine glass and you put it on the edge of the, the table here and you knock it off, right, and it falls and experiences some impact and trauma to it, what's going to happen to that wine glass? It'll probably break because it's fragile, right? Now you take a plastic cup, you put it there and you knock it off. It falls off and it hits the ground. What's going to happen to it? Just it just kind of bounce, right? Mm -hmm. And does it, does it, um, is it better off or worse off for having experienced that trauma? Not necessarily. It's just kind of, it's already durable, right? But there are some materials in this world that are actually anti-fragile, that they need stress, they need difficulty in order to become stronger. Plants, uh, muscle, bone, right? And humans. We thrive with difficulty in life. And our modern obsession, it really is. Like, just think about the difference of when it was when, like, we grew up, how. And yes, the world culture has changed. Like, we feel like it's not as safe to let our kids be out past a certain hour, right? My, my mom didn't know where I was until I was about you know, at 6 o'clock dinner time, right? It was like, just be home in time for dinner. And I didn't, she didn't have my location and know where I was and all these things that we put in place to kind of bubble wrap the kids. And we're experiencing a whole bunch of children that, that are not, um, they don't feel like they can take on the world because, and, and that results in depression, that results in anxiety uh, because they have never been severely challenged. It's almost like they have to introduce some kind of severe challenge in order for them to feel worthwhile in life. And so there's this other, um, I don't know if you know Lenore Skenazy, she's America's worst mom. If you Google search America's worst mom, she comes up and it's because she had this nine-year-old son. She lives in New York. And after several times of taking the subway, the kid wanted to take, um, wanted to go to, I think a store or something on his own. And she knew that he was a very um, adept kid and knew where he was in life and could take directions. And so he said, I wanted to go get this thing by, you know, at the store myself. And so she said, okay, go for it, right? Turned him loose, a nine-year-old kid in the subway of, of New York City. And he came home successful, was able, to, and somebody caught wind of it and just like raked her over the coals. Like she is the America's worst mom for trusting her son to go out on his own like this. And, and so now she's kind of just taking this whole thing to this free range kids idea. Like we're, we're raising children so tightly compact and bubble wrapped that they're largely unaware of their own capacity and strengths. And that's why there's causing so much of this, this, uh, you know, anxiety, depression and, and, um, unfulfillment in their life. So giving them opportunities. Yeah, go ahead. So like the concept of that, like I totally understand what you're saying, but like 
I think the reason why a lot of people feel that way, the way they do now, is because we see all these horrible things happen, and we yeah. want to prevent those horrible things from happening right. to children. So that's why we do those things. So how do we, I'm asking you, like, yeah. how do we combat that? Because like allowing our children to experience bad things, and like because that's what they need to grow and develop, but yet at the same time, also protecting them yeah. from the way the world is now. You know right. What I mean? like, oh man, absolutely. It's such a like a fine line to walk. It <laughs> really is, and yeah. particularly you know, per, yeah, we feel it, and uh, it's a daily battle. I gotta say, this is not easy, particularly where culture is at. So I empathize with you. Like we're regularly having to find opportunities where we give our kids opportunities to experience difficult things. I'm gonna throw out two ways. Number one, we often trade our children's resilience for convenience. I want you to think about every time you say, well, it's just so much more convenient to do this. That's one of the ways that we take that bit of resilience away from that child. And it is terribly inconvenient. But is their growth and development worth it, right? Um, and we've had to say, yeah, yeah, it is. It's, it's a challenge. So um, specific examples. I really don't like the have my location thing. Let me ask you guys, if you were a teenager today, would you want your parents knowing where you were all the time? No, right? Never. None of us would sign up for that. But yet we have done that to our kids. I've had it happen to me. I mean, that technology came out right when I was an older teenager. So oh, yeah. like the time I was like 17, 18, I was still living at home. Yeah. And my parents put that on my phone. How'd you like it? It was horrible. It was horrible. <laughs> right? Horrible. It feels like to shackles. Go, I wanted to get in my car and go with my friend. I didn't know right. my mom knowing where I was. Like, That's an important <laughs> part of independence and resistance. Resilience. That's personally one. Now, the technology was invented for good things. It was invented for find my iPhone, right? You lose your iPhone. Oh, where is it? I'll get on the computer and oh, yeah, okay, it fell out of my pocket at the park or whatever, and you can go find it. Great. But now we've used it for a counterproductive purpose and restricting our, our freedoms. And, but it is so convenient. See, they didn't it's have so that convenient. Way. So this brings up an important point of this whole discussion, and that is the resilience model, all of these distress tolerance tools are not going to be effective in the heat of the moment. <laughs> you have to teach them when they're calm and logical and want to learn. In fact, the best way to do it is like, hey, check out, I found this new app and I was exploring this distress tolerance tool. It helps like when I get stressed about this, I'm going to do this. Right? You explore these coping skills with them because one of the tools that we've really started to use a whole lot more is this phrase with our kids. You've ever noticed your kids come to you all the time wanting to solve their problems? All the time. If you're not careful, they will enlist you to solve every problem in, your, in their life. And so we use this phrase. Wow, I guess you're gonna have to figure that out, right? Oh, that's a hard one. I mean, yeah. How would you do it? Yeah. What do you think? Well, that sounds like a good idea. You should go try it. Go ahead. So it's a, it is a major challenge to get kids to focus in and, and take the responsibility. But that's exactly what we're, we're here to do as parents is really support them, celebrate their successes, support them through their failures, let them fail, let them experience those difficulties. A whole lot more than we do currently. Like we're, we really are as a society bubble wrapping our kids. So, um, and it's counterculture. I mean, it is counterculture to tell your kid that they should walk three blocks to school. When you're also talking about depression, um, another, so depression is kind of, it's worrying about things of the past. Anxiety is about worrying about things of the future. Okay, so if there's a lot of depression in the past, that can be really helpful with some counseling because it's gonna help them process those traumas or difficult times of the past, okay, to move forward. Um, and really what we're talking about there is that building connections part. They need somebody that they can be safe with, feel safe with, to open up and experience those uncomfortable emotions with.
And unfortunately, I've come to find out as a parent, that's not always me. In fact, it's never me because of who I am. Like I'm too big and scary of a dad or I'm not the right personality that they're going to feel compassion from. Thankfully, my wife does a little bit better at that. And that's a challenge that we have to help provide those, those safe places. Um, journaling. Journaling is a huge one for processing past experiences. Um, and it's not as common. People don't use pen and paper as much today. There is a journaling feature on that app, but I highly, highly recommend pen on paper because there is something special about the tactile um, release of information and emotion into that page. And it can be torn up and thrown away or it can be kept. You know, there's some real encouragement. There's a, a whole lesson about helping people identify who their support group is. And it goes through discussing like what does a person need to express in order to show up for you emotionally in a, in a helpful way, you know? And then it poses the question, do you show up that way for other people in your life? Because an important part of, um, of emotional resilience is realizing that you have contribution to the world and that you can show up and be helpful for other people. Sometimes service is some of the most therapeutic kind of um, activity when you're not feeling strong connection because you're on the other side of that equation now. You're providing that safe space or that help to somebody else. So get them involved in service. Um, and I would also like um, put a plug in there's so many service opportunities here in St. George, particularly with the old folks' homes that are all over the place. They love having people come in and help like do crafts with the residents or like basically every day. Any, um, and the way I found them was jump on justserve.org. And there's a lot of like local listings of people who just need some helping hands. And um, we did that for our daughter one day when she was, um, <coughs> feeling very disconnected when her phone got taken away from her because of some of her behaviors. And, uh, and she needed to do some service and that she came home very, very fulfilled that night for having spent some time outside of her own brain. So, and that honestly does help them open up to see, okay, now who can I trust? I, I've contributed, how can I, um, who can I feel more safe with now? So was, was what we talked about helpful? You have some, some tools, some skills that you think you can implement. Again, don't try to use them in the heat of the moment. When you're hijacked, don't try to use them. Learn them first, okay? Go spend some time on there, practice it, and then when you're hijacked, start using them. You have to learn them in a calm, a logical thinking state first. Well, you guys have been awesome. Thank you so much for having me today. And um, yeah, if you have any more questions, feel free to jump on our website. Anyway, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you.